I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker, um, my wonderful wife, Whitney Lee Bitter Belkowitz. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today. Uh, we have four babies at home, and uh, she's doing a great job taking care of them. She just sent me pictures of everybody eating dinner, so we're good. I don't have to come home right now. All right, score one. That's one score. Um, Whitney has been in the concrete industry for 15 years now. Um, she started with me on our first date in a concrete lab, and I almost fired her because she stopped the timer when she wasn't supposed to. She has her bachelor's in civil engineering. She's been running multiple companies, five companies now that focus on new and emerging technologies with concrete, and she's one of my favorite lab technicians to work with in the world. Um, oh, no, that is not what you were supposed to do. Her uh, presentation was on uh, the specifications for colloidal silica and concrete, uh, why we care about it, why the industry needs that, and um, the future of those specifications. Um, overview of the presentation, I wanted to give a quick background into who we are, what we do for a living, but more importantly, the purpose, looking at these past and then future uh, methods of getting colloidal silica for concrete into the ready mix and concrete construction industries. Uh, we'll dive into the objectives, the meat and potatoes of the presentation, wrap it up with a concise summary, and then open up the floor for any questions. So that's me over there, and that's my, my boss on the right. That's Whitney, and uh, she's our CTO. Y'all want to file in? We've got some chairs. Scott the Loretta, we got some chairs up front. Josh, beautiful chairs. I heard you get free candy when you sit up front. I know a lot about that. Um, so we run an organization called Colloidal Silica and Concrete Association, and the whole idea of it is to spread the wealth of knowledge out there to help folks use colloidal silica in or on their concrete. It's very altruistic. And I, listen, this presentation is death by PowerPoint. If anybody here has gone death through PowerPoint, I promise I'm not going to read off of any more slides like this, or like reading them to you, but we wanted to design this as a resource so that you can pull this off the ACI website use the links, print it out, and you would have ready access information at your disposal. So the current usage, colloidal silica has become extremely popular within the last 15 years, more so within the last three to five years. It's really just exploded in the industry, and it's being used right now to solve a manifold of concrete in issues. And the harsh reality is, and whether you want to admit it or not, we have a a multitude of problems with few viable solutions. And the unfortunate reality is we have a limitation on our mature technologies. Now, as engineers, as concrete designers, as contractors, as academics, as professionals, we always have to be looking forward to what's the next solution to create the 50-year design life, the 100-year design life, or even the 30-year design life with, with less maintenance costs to it. Colloidal silica has been proven on and off the job site, from the book creek to lab creek to the real creek we were talking about before. Now it's the point of not even proving to the architects and engineers, it's just gone um, saturation in the industry. And the types of job sites that you can see it on, this is one of my favorite ones. This was at um, Eagle County Airport. Um, this was a job that we did um, in front of their ARF facility, their air rescue facility. Uh, slip form pavement. Um, we use the colloidal silica at just over six ounces per hundred weight, and the impetus behind using it was to increase resiliency to physical and chemical attack while achieving 24 hour strengths to open up that active taxiway, that, that taxiway to traffic. So, pavements, bridges, building, driveways, and buildings, we've used colloidal silica in concrete, and then on concrete, because we can mix colloidal silica in concrete and spray it on concrete. Uh, we've used it in deteriorated bridges, concrete slabs meant for resilient floors, as well as water tanks. So really, there are, are few places where you can, or that you cannot use colloidal silica and concrete, um, and a lot of folks are finding the value-added performance from uh, replacing fly ash, an internal curing agent, as well as rehabilitating concrete. And when we talk about colloidal silica, and I say colloidal silica, um, taking pictures. You don't have to take pictures. This is available online, I promise. Um, it's a liquid dispersion, clear to milky. Um, I say colloidal silica because there is nano silica. You can buy dried nano silica. 
My preference is using in a liquid dispersion, clear to milky, surface area anywhere between 80 and 500 meters squared per gram in the specific surface area. And the solids content can go anywhere from 5 to 50%. And normally what we see with our colloidal silica is similar to our class, fly, class F fly ash from back in the day, which under a transmission electron microscope, we're seeing that ball bearing effect or that ball bearing, that really small particle that is amorphous silica. So on the right, we have our nano silica in suspension. On the left, we have our class F fly ash. And for those of you who don't know what nano means, it's Latin, I think it's Latin, for 10 to the minus ninth. So a nanometer is 10 to the minus ninth meter. And for a reference, a hair on your head, obviously not mine, is around 100,000 to 150,000 nanometers in diameter. And why, thanks for laughing, everybody. That was pretty awesome. Um, why do we care about nanosilica, colloidal silica? It promotes posilonic reaction, the development of more of that backbone of concrete strength through the consumption of calcium hydroxide. We have particle to particle packing, we have void filling, all these things that create an environment where the concrete is less susceptible to physical and chemical attack. And the, what is so special about it? We've got these really fancy terms. First one is easy. You got a really small particle that's really reactive. Your um, posilonic reaction takes off like a bat out of hell. Now, because of that, because there's more reactions, we see this accelerated cement dissolution. And there's a wonderful paper written back in 2003, and there's another one in 2004 by this coal miner named Bjorn Bjornstrom that goes into this phenomena right here. And then the last thing is a really fancy schmancy name, heterogeneous nucleation. What we're trying to say is really small things will encourage other things to grow on it. And ultimately, that's what we're seeing with our nanoparticles in solution. They have a much smaller force field in suspension as opposed to a micron-sized particle, so things will want to grow on its surface. Now, again, the science I didn't want to get too much into, what we're supposed to talk about today is the specifications. And I know this might sound surprising, but colloidal silica does not have its own specification right now. So what we are using is, and when I say we, uh, it's not French, I mean the royal we, tough crap, royal we as in the entire industry has found using ASTM C494, which is the chemical admixture specification or the standard specification for chemical admixtures for concrete, the specification covers the rest. There's a type S specification for a specific performance admixture. Now this is totally performance based, so that means we're running about a year's worth of tests, if not more. If you've never seen it, this is for educational purposes only. This is an older rendition, so please go look up the newer version. But this is your 494 that folks are currently going to, and it is, I think it's like six tests without the specific performance, and the compressive strength lasts over a year, but most of the tests that you have in that, that, that specification last about three months. So you get the majority of your, your, your results in three months. And maybe if you're doing some 18 month tests, obviously that'll take longer. Um, so the, what the 494 gives the industry, I, I wrote it up there as do no harm test. And I, I don't mind the argument on that, but what you'll see out of using the, the 494, it lets the engineers, the designers, the specifier know what your product is going to do harmful to the concrete. And oftentimes people are kind of confused when you look at it. I mean, you're doing a, a comparison between a reference concrete and that same concrete with your technology. And it's a fresh and hardened properties comparison. And you can have a minus 10% or a 10% a reduction in strength and still meet the ASTM or I still pass the ASTM C494 Type S. And the reason is there are some admixtures out there like microbial induced corrosion. Getting strength back is nothing, but creating an environment where the microbes don't start you know, flourishing, you know, like I said, anybody can get strength, but having that special of an admixture, nobody minds or most folks don't mind if you do reduce strength a, a skosh. Or a bit. So as you can see, compressive strength, flexural strength, time of set, shrinkage, freeze-thaw durability, and then of course your special performance. And with all of these, you're allowed, you are allowed a, a, a minus or a plus from the reference, but as it turns out with your type S, you're definitely allowed a, a minus over the reference. Now when we talk 
the special performance. You know, we happen to include more than one when we used to do our 494s for our clients, but you really only need one. And please bear in mind, the 494 is not supposed to be used as a brochure. So really, when you're talking about do no harm, this mix is 517 in the total cementitious, total cement. 1250 on the sand, 1750 on the rock, a 0.47 on your water cementitious ratio, a skosh of, of water reducer, and enough air to pass the freeze thaw durability test. So this isn't your pavement mix, or this is an ultra high performance mix, or even a shotcrete mix. This is a very generic type of mix. Okay, so that was the past. Now we go into the future, because as it turns out, colloidal silica is more like an SCM than an admixture, despite the fact the 494, did I just break something? The 494 being a good, a, I hate to use the term loophole, but a good direction for what we have right now since there is nothing much. Um, what we want to do is create something that is more um, um, germane to the supplementary cementitious material that colloidal silica is. So what we've focused on is creating something similar for this new ASTM for colloidal silica it's called colloidal silica for use in concrete. We focused on creating something similar to ASTMC 618 for coal fly ash and raw calcine natural poslins, as well as for the silica fume uh, ASTM out there. And funny enough, we took a similar name, silica fume used in concrete, coal fly ash, blah, 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 for use in concrete, colloidal silica for use in concrete. And this approach that we took for the ASTM was focused more on a, a, a physical and chemical analysis for uniformity, not focusing on performance-based testing as you would in the 494. And we find that more susceptible and more practical for the manufacturers and distributors out there. And you'll see it in our, our scope of work where we talk about what the colloidal silica is used for. And the most important part to me is that the performance achieved in concrete will vary. So creating a, a strength activity index, you have to get at least this or no more than that is a very difficult thing to do because not all colloidal silicas are created equal. Um, and just to give you a quick snapshot, a, a, a quick peek into the magical world of this new ASTM, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it isn't New Jersey, right? We're, we're almost there. I like Ooh, I like that joke. Um, we're about, what, one more ballot away, maybe a second ballot away from getting this ASTM done. And these are one of the tables. This is for our chemical requirements of the colloidal silica. And it just goes through the rhetoric of what we should expect out of a standard colloidal silica and ways that you can easily measure it. With something like this, you should be no more than 28 days for verifying what you have. And the ultimate idea was to give something to the end users and the manufacturers so that they can verify that what they purchase, what they order, the colloidal silica, is in fact colloidal silica as, and is in fact the uniform to what they ordered off the website. Okie dokie. So to summarize um, the purpose of this presentation, I wanted to give you a, a quick peek into where colloidal silica is being used, why it's important for us as engineers, contractors, specifiers, and architects to recognize this is coming into the industry and that there are rules uh, for the materials out there to make sure that we're getting consistency. We went over the current specifications and then of course the future specifications that are coming down the chute, no pun intended. And at this point, I would like to open up the floor for any questions. And I remind you, if you're gonna ask a question, please come up to the mic. Uh, 